So we're very pleased to have Professor Julie Harris with us from the University of St. Andrews. Um, Julie is a professor of psychology um, at the University of St. Andrews. Her research investigates visual systems and camouflage, a human visual system. She did her BSc in physics and then a PhD in human visual perception at uh, the Queen's College, Oxford. She did a postdoc at Smith Kettlewell um, Eye Research Institute in the US and a postdoc in the University Laboratory of Physiology at Oxford. Um, she served um, uh, in, in multiple roles as a member and director and committees and boards involved in vision sciences and conferences. She's an editorial uh, uh, board member uh, of different visual um, science journals as Vision, Vision Research, uh, Journal of uh, Vision. She was involved in conferences, organization and committees, and she um, has uh, mentored with a number in a number of schemes uh, across uh, Scottish universities, Women in Vision UK and in Experimental um, um, Psychology Society. And we're very pleased to have you today with us uh, to talk about your fascinating uh, research, a very um, unordinary topic. Um, so welcome to our seminar. Uh, we're very pleased to have you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I must say, it is a, it's an honour to be invited to uh, this series of talks. When I looked and saw who was giving the talks, I thought, wow, that's nice, thank you. Uh, so let me start by sharing the screen. Is that working? Yes, definitely, we're seeing, uh, the, yeah, the, seeing, yeah, we're the, seeing the presentation. Okay, let me, I'm just moving things around a little bit on the screen so that I can at least see some of the audience, which is always nice. Okay. Let me do that, right. And I'm gonna put my slides somewhere where it looks like I'm looking at you guys. That will, that will help too. Okay, so oh, let me get back to the start. Um, this is St. Andrews. This is a, a view from the beach. Uh, I work in a, an ancient university in a, a little town on the coast of Scotland. Um, it's kind of chilly here today, but at least I'm in my warm and cozy office. So uh, I know that some of the audience know me and probably know me from um, a lot of my early work has been on uh, binocular vision. Uh, and, but I've also done a lot of work on um, three dimensional perception and shape perception. And that has led into this recent collaboration uh, where we're applying ideas from human vision to uh, the study of animal camouflage. So that's why the talk's entitled Shape from Shading in Nature, Does it Provide Optimal Camouflage? These are my collaborators. Hope you, hopefully you can see my mouse wiggling around. Yes. Yeah, we do. We uh, do. The, the bulk of the work in this study was done by the uh, two people who were both postdocs on the project at the time, Olivier Panacchio, who's a, a computational modeler, and George Lovell, who uh, traditionally has been a psychophysicist. We also have two tame zoology collaborators, Graham Ruxton from St. Andrews and Innes Cuttle from Bristol, uh, and Simon Sanger was also involved in the project doing some uh, wild bird field experiments, which I was very excited about, but I didn't actually do, and you'll hear about those later. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about camouflage, uh, what it is in general in the animal kingdom. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, specifically counter shading and how that links to human vision and shape from shading. And then we'll get on to our own research. Uh, computational modeling, some behavioral experiments, and then we'll explore the physical properties of countershaded animals. If anybody has any clarifications they want to ask during the talk, uh, please put it in the chat. Although right now, for some bizarre reason, I can't actually see the chat. So you're probably gonna have to, uh, somebody else is gonna have to point that out to me. Yeah, I will, Julie, I will. If there's uh, issues in the chat, I'll make uh, I'll okay. the right one to That's great, that. thank you. So camouflage is a very beautiful thing. There's, a, there's several am, am, animals camouflaged in these scenes. This is a uh, moth I'm just outlining on sitting on a piece of tree bark. Uh, this is a, some sort of a grouse, a, a mountain ground bird. She's really well camouflaged, but even better camouflaged are her, I can never remember whether there are five or six babies in this image. There's, there's one here, there's a little one here, 
there's two here and there's at least one over here. So camouflage takes a, a lot of forms. It's difficult to study. Uh, zoologists have tried to classify it into different forms, although of course many animals are probably exploiting different forms of camouflage at the same time. We decided to focus on one, uh, and this is it. It's called countershaded, countershading. Now these two uh, sharks are illustrating it very nicely. Countershading is the phenomenon where animals are typically dark on the top, light underneath. So to put it more technically, the dorsal and ventral regions of the pelt and the skin are dark and light respectively. It's quite a ubiquitous patterning across the animal kingdom. Uh, it's present in mammals, reptiles, fish, and even insects. So doubtless it's been interesting, it's been uh, interesting to um, zoologists for a long time. So what might it be for? There have been at least three main suggestions. The first is thermoregulation. Darker areas absorb more heat. And if you live in a cool environment and want to be warm, you might want to absorb more heat from the sun, which is largely coming from above. Almost in complete contrast to that is that uh, you might want to protect against too much sun, against UV radiation. The darker pigments in the skin typically contain melanin and potentially protect against damage. The other idea that's being put forward is that of visual camouflage, hiding an animal from its predators or its prey by using this form of patterning. We're going to focus on that latter possibility. And within that, there are at least two competing visual theories about why this pattern may have evolved and why it might help animals hide from predators or prey. The first is background matching and the second obliterative shading. So I'll take those one at a time. But first, the key environmental factor to consider is one I've already touched on. And that is that in the natural environment, light tends to come from above. In fact, you can see it reflected on me now. I'm, I look quite light here, quite dark under here. Uh, that happens in the human environment, but also the natural environment. And because of that, background matching might appear obvious. So back to the shark analogy. So if a shark's being viewed from below, its background is always going to be very light. So you might want to be as light as possible on your pelt. If you're a shark and you're being viewed from above, the background is going to be very dark looking down into the depths of the ocean. So you probably want to be dark. So the, the background matching theory of um, cancer shedding camouflage is very simple. But obviously there's something missing from that. Um, this person is very beautifully uh, count, uh, um, background matched against his background, all this, although this is not counter shading. But the problem is it's a two dimensional theory if you think about it. As soon as the viewpoint changes or you view a different person from a different angle, uh, that background matching no longer works. Now, sometimes that's fine. So here we have a, a praying mantis sitting on a, a tree bark uh, and it's a fairly flat animal. It's a fairly flat tree. The background matching can work quite beautifully. But for more three dimensional objects being viewed from multiple angles, the problem's a bit different. So a uniform 3D object like this one, this is a rendered cylinder. This has exactly the same uh, rendered gray as its background. But we've lit this from above and slightly left and you'll see that it appears to be lighter because there's a, a combination of the shape of the object and the lighting means that uh, radiance coming to your eye more comes from the top of the object than from the bottom. And you'll see that there's actually a gradient uh, of, of light as we go from the top of the object to the bottom. Now, those of us who study vision will go, oh yeah, of course, you're just talking about shape from shading. So here's a, a beautiful example of shape from shading from Leonardo. We know that shape from shading is a major cue to shape. The human visual system is really sensitive to it. And it occurs because one of the, well, one of the major reasons it occurs is because light's not coming from all directions. Here's a simpler rendered scene. For many of you, I hope this looks like a sort of button sticking out from a flat background, 
essentially what you have here is a circle with a, a gradient of illumination from light to dark. So that's as, th as if this object's being lit from um, slightly above and left. So we know that for the human visual system, shape from shading can aid in object detection. It can allow identification of the 3D shape of a target item. It's quite an effective cue also to extract the shape of an object. And here's an example from a study by Neffs. People are shown rendered scenes like this, and this is a little gauge figure. And the idea is that this is a little patch on the surface and you wiggle it around so that the, until you get the surface normal sticking out. Uh, and when, once you're sure that that's normal to the surface, you move on to the next patch. Over the here are some results from that study. Each of these lines shows the amount of error. So in a lot of these regions, there's very, very little error. People are actually very good at correctly extracting the surface normal and judging the, the shape. Obviously, there are, there are anomalies around the very edges of, of the object. And what about animals? Uh, it's much more controversial trying to figure out whether animals uh, it, we know that animals can respond to these sort of stimuli, whether they actually perceive three-dimensional shape is a very difficult thing to study. Um, we certainly know that pigeons can discriminate uh, convex pointy objects from concave ones. That's been done in behavioural studies by Cook et al. We also know that animals can respond to change their patterning based on shaded patterns. Uh, this animal is a cuttlefish sitting in a bath that's sitting on top of a, a background. And you can see here that there's a the subtle um, shading gradient from dark to light amongst these patches. And this one is a much harder border. What the animal can do is change this part of its skin in the center to be more like the shading gradient. You should be able to see here that there's a hard border between dark and light but here there's a, there's a much more subtle border. So the cuttlefish alter their coloration. So this suggests that it, it, it must pay to, to be able to make these subtle distinctions. Okay, so that brings me to the fact that we therefore need a three-dimensional counter shading theory, and that's called obliterative shading. Uh, it's a simple idea, uh, as it says in the slide, animal coloration counteracts the three-dimensional shape from shading to reduce visibility. So here's a uniform object. If I now render an object uh, that exactly and oppositely matches this shading gradient, so I make it dark on the top and light underneath and view it in the same lighting conditions, that three-dimensionality from the shape from shading disappears. If the color of that object is also set carefully to match the background, it will completely disappear apart from um, the self-shadowing. So I'm just going to explain the same thing in a different way. Imagine two birds. One is a uniform colour, one is countershaded, so that it, it's, its pelt or its feathers are dark on the top, light underneath. If we put that in a sunny environment, uh, this one will have a shading grade, gradient on it from light to dark. And if in the, the right place, this one will be totally matched and the three dimensionality will disappear. Uh, and if it's evolved to match its background, it will potentially completely disappear. So that's the idea of obliterative shading. The pelt shading uh, com completely counteracts or partially counteracts the shape from shading that's been delivered by a combination of the shape of the object and the light source. Aha, uh -huh, but I'm sure you're thinking, right? It's not that easy, is it? It's very easy for me to say that that's how it works. But of course, the shape from shading on any skin is going to depend on the animal's shape, but also the light direction. That depends on the habitat, the time of day, the time of year, the latitude, the weather, a whole host of things. And just to illustrate that, this is an example from a, a model that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, where uh, this deer has been rendered with the appropriate patterning for different conditions. So if it's cloudy at 12 noon uh, in the south of England, it should look like this. If it happens to be up at 7 a.m. and it's sunny with the sun elevation at 30 degrees, so that's a particular time of year, its patterning ought to be like that. And 
if it's sunny but it's noon, again, a, a different pattern would be most appropriate. So that's a problem that um, is, is there, difficult to solve. Um, that's one of the things we had to go at. Turns out there's actually been very little research on this other than the assertion of the theory and the idea that counter shading might be used to obliteratively shade an animal. There haven't been any specific measures of the variation in reflectance across animal pelts. Neither, well, not none, but very few predictions have been made of what camouflage will be suitable for specific animal shapes and habits. And there's little knowledge of whether predators find countershaded prey harder to detect or not. So uh, we developed a physical light model of countershading. We use it to predict optimal countershading for specific species. And we tested how sensitive predators are to different patterns of countershading. And then we measured countershading and shape in animals, uh, looking for whether the countershading is appropriate for the shape. So throughout this, I'm going to talk mostly about modeling and experiments where our species of choice are caterpillars. And uh, we used, um, the caterpillars of a variety of uh, large moths that deliver at least a large caterpillar that's about the size of my finger uh, when, um, when it's uh, at its full size. Here's one on a branch. These are uh, native in uh, parts of the UK, Europe, and some of them in North America, uh, although typically none of these are native in Scotland. They, they tend not to make it through a Scottish summer. Oops. Okay, so the reason, one of the reasons we're using caterpillars is that it's a simple shape, it's roughly cylindrical. Uh, we, we had a hope that our modelling might be easy to do. We can breed and study them in the lab, and certainly in the UK, uh, it's possible to obtain eggs and breed these animals uh, without complicated licensing issues because they're insects. And they're also predated by a, a wide range of species, so we can study predation by generalist predators. So uh, the first step was to develop, to develop a physical light model. What we typically did, used for our mod model animal to start with was a, a Lambertian cylinder, uh, but you can also use an ovoid. Uh, and it's uh, lying on some ground plane. Uh, we can vary the role of the animal, the pitch of it, and the yaw of it. So three degrees of freedom. We rendered cylinders in a realistic software lighting environment called Radiance. Uh, and this allows us to specify a sunny or cloudy sky, specific time of day, year, latitude, and so on. And it also uses a standard uh, vision descriptions of the spatial distribution of daylight according to CIE. Uh, we use two types of lighting. So if this is a little ovoid specimen sitting on a ground plane, uh, we could have a, a sunny sky, where, which uh, essentially requires a point source of light, a location specified by the time of day, year, and so on. Or we could also have a cloudy sky where that, uh, that one imagines, some of you may find this hard to imagine, but it's easy for me looking out of the window, uh, a dull grey day, which happens very often across a, a lot of Britain where light uh, comes from pretty much all angles. The irradiance is nearly isotropic in what we're rendering as a hemispheric sky. If we look at the radiance uh, in some normalised arbitrary unit coming off little patches that can be oriented, this is pitch, uh, where zero is pointing leftwards uh, and you can see uh, the other angles here. For a sunny sky, you get a, a very uh, abrupt change in radiance up to a peak. Uh, for cloudy, it's more variable. Just, just a couple of examples there. Okay, so here's the model. It's actually very simple. So for a body with Lambertian reflectance, the irradiance is the uh, light falling onto the body from the light source at some location. The reflectance, that's think about that as the patterning on the skin. 
and the radiance out going from the body, so that's the light that impinges at the eye of the viewer, uh, is given by the product of those two. So another way of thinking about that, if you don't like equations, is that the light impinging at the eye of the viewer is a product of uh, irradiance, which is a combination of the light source and the object shape, um, because the light source, uh, the object shape determines what's going to be normal to uh, whether the patch is normal uh, facing the light source and so on. Uh, and it also depends on the reflectance that the patterning on the object. Okay, so what we're trying to do is develop a counter shaded animal. So how do we choose the reflectance for optimal camouflage? Oops. This is uh, essentially what I told you before. So for a uniform reflectance object on the left, the shading is due to the shape and the lighting. The if the reflectance is the inverse of that irradiance, then you get obliterative shading. And if you add a constant, you can also get perfect matching to the background. So there's our basic equation. For optimal camouflage, you remove the shading and match the background. So the reflectance essentially is uh, the radiance of the background divided by the irradiance, which is different for every patch because every patch is pointing in a different direction. So that's the, the basis of the model. What's interesting and easier is to, to look at some results. So I've drawn a little caterpillar here, but this, uh, what, we, what we've done to start with is render this for a purely cylindrical object. Uh, and you have to be absolutely specific about what you're rendering. So uh, this is uh, a sunny day in Bristol on July the 5th at noon with the caterpillar horizontal and facing the sun. So this would be its optimal reflectance. So on the y-axis, I'm plotting the optimal reflectance. Uh, and this is the position. So the center of the animal's back is here, uh, going round on one side to the belly and the other side to the belly. Down here, I've got a sort of flattened skin of the animal as if it's being cut and stretched out. Uh, depending on what screen you're using, that might be very difficult to see, but the, the graphs are easier. So notice that you want, um, your optimal reflectance is to have very low reflectance. That means dark on the back and much uh, higher reflectance, lighter on the belly. But you can see that this changes subtly uh, depending on the conditions. So on the left now, you can see what I've just showed you. But if we change the uh, conditions so that it's the same time of day, year, latitude, etc., but the weather's changed, uh, you now get quite a different optimal shading gradient. And if this animal was up at sunrise instead of noon, the pattern will be different again. And this one's interesting because there's, there's a sort of dark stripe along, along the animal here. So the point of this modeling is really to demonstrate that different patterns are gonna be optimal for different weather, time of day and time of year. But sometimes the differences are, are quite subtle. So one question you might ask yourself is, well, maybe this is too subtle. Does this really matter? So we shall see. So, so far we've developed a physical light model and used it to predict optimal counter shading for uh, a caterpillar. We've used a cylinder, but in actually in principle, the model can apply it to any shape. Uh, and we've looked at this at different times of day, different times of year and with different weather conditions. Okay, so that's, that's where our first couple of aims now. Let's see whether this actually matters for predators. How am I doing? Okay. I use two generalist predators uh, for two very different types of experiment. Uh, one set done in my lab and another with collaborators in Bristol. So our first gen generalist predator is uh, the human visual system. This is George Lovell, who was uh, responsible for the, uh, the design and setup of most of the human vision experiments. Our second set of generalist predators were, uh, these are wild birds uh, in, uh, who live in an English woodland uh, close to Bristol University. And uh, two very different sets of experiments, but coming to quite similar conclusions. So let's start with the, the human stuff. We're gonna do a task that's rather like visual search, only it takes a li little longer than a lot of visual search type studies. 
people are searching for ellipsoid targets that look a little bit like this. So these are ovoid. Uh, we can render them with any kind of shading that we want. Uh, we can make the counter shading optimal for a particular weather, particular animal orientation, etc. In this example, this is a uniform object lit from above, and you can see there's that uh, three dimensional shading gradient on it. Now we're going to present these amidst uh, a whole field of what we call folded leaves. So these have the same two dimensional shape as the object that people will be looking for. Uh, but essentially these are rendered as if they were a, a flat object that's been folded at some angle and we have a, a number of different random angles. Uh, and so these are therefore have quite dramatically different gradients across them. So here's an example. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about these weird squares. I don't know why they're there, but uh, the rest of it looks much like the rendered scene that we had. So what you're looking at here is a load of uh, our folded leaf distractors. And somewhere in here, there is a target object. Uh, so the scene itself is rendered for cloudy weather. The target object does not have counter shading on it. Uh, if anybody can see it, you could wave or shout or something. Has anybody found it yet? Um, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, we've got a few. Okay, so if you haven't, there it is. Okay, so when we do this task, people see the stimulus um, for a certain amount of time. As soon as they see the target, uh, they press a button. We call that the reaction time. As soon as they do that, that a mask appears, which is a, a sort of shredded version of the scene they were looking at. Uh, and then they see uh, another scene with, with outlines of all the targets and distractors, and they turn a dial to choose to tell us which one was the target. So we're, we're able to measure the time it takes to find it and whether they accurately found it or not. We used uh, several different conditions for the scenes themselves. We used cloudy or sunny weather and the distractors are rendered as part of the scene. The target is rendered separately and we can choose to give it no counter shading, counter shading that's optimal for a cloudy scene or for a sunny scene. So that's the one you just saw, which was a, a cloudy rendered scene, a target with no counter shading. So I'm going to show in the results that this is, this is the scene rendering, this is the target rendering. So that's a, a t-shirt with no counter shading on it. Oops. This is a separate scene, a cloudy one, and here we've got a target that has uh, counter shading that's optimal for cloudy. So again, you might want to have a little search around uh, just because of the location of this target, it's a little bit harder to find. I can see some people looking at it. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's top, top left-ish. So again, that was a, a cloudy scene, but the target was shaded for optimal um, counter shading for that scene. And if you look carefully at it, you can see that, that there is no shading on that object. So people are asked to do this task. They're asked to find the object. They're not told which of the conditions they're, they're looking at at any particular time. OK, so I'm going to show you some results now. So top left shows you that these are results for uh, a scene rendered as though it's a cloudy day. We're going to look at accuracy for uh, uh, targets that are, have no counter shading, for those that are optimal for the cloudy weather, and for those that are optimal for the sunny weather. Uh, and then we also show reaction time for the same three target conditions. So in terms of accuracy, people are much less accurate at detecting this target when the counter shading is optimal, or when that on the target matches that of the rendered scene. And they are also slower. So this means that the, the uh, camouflage is working. Uh, you, you, if you find them, you find them more slowly, uh, and, but very often you don't find them correctly. So that was the cloudy rendered scene. Of course, the really interesting condition is what happens when you render for sunny weather, does it make a difference? And yes, it does. So under sunny rendering conditions, 
people are much better, uh, much worse at this task when the object is counter shaded for the sunny conditions. They are less accurate and they are also slower. So accuracy is lowest and reaction time is long, longest for optimal counter shading. So although potentially the difference between the counter shading rendered for the sunny and the cloudy scene is quite subtle, it's very clear that uh, human observers uh, are quite sensitive to these subtle differences. We also explored position. So we were able to move the animal. Uh, we altered the pitch, we altered the yaw, and we altered the roll. And these are results for those different conditions. So again, I'm plotting accuracy uh, versus departure in pitch and reaction time versus departure in pitch. And going from zero to 90, this is degrees of angle away from optimal. So least accurate uh, for the optimal counter shading, most accurate when it's 90 degrees away. So you can see that accuracy goes up, reaction time goes down. That's for a departures in pitch. We get a similar sort of pattern for departures in roll and a similar sort of pattern again for departures in yaw. So uh, movement of the animal in that direction. So accuracy is worst and reaction time slowest when um, the counter shading is close to optimal for each of the manip manipulations. So, so the, the bottom line here is that these, these subtle differences are important. So to summarize that, incorrect counter shading with the animal at the wrong orientation or the wrong weather makes the targets easier and faster to detect. So the counter shading doesn't need to be perfect. That's what the last three graphs showed. Rotations of around 15 degrees were not detected significantly more than, more easily than for optimal counter shading. But having said that, for 30 degree rotations, the, work, the responses were significantly different. So counter shading should, that we've sort of quantified how subtle the counter shading needs to be. Okay, so that's the human experiments. Now we're doing experiments with wild birds. Julie, is it possible, mm -hmm. there are a few uh, questions in the chat and I was wondering if you would like to answer them now before you move on to the next example. Yeah, uh, why not? Question. Now, for some reason, <laughs> you I, can't, I can't find the chat. I don't know where it's gone. So could you ask them for yeah. me? So, okay, so um, one question is, does those function depend on the location X only or are, function, or are functions on the 3D, um, angle to the observer and impinging light. I'm not sure I understand correctly, but uh, maybe Gal, you can um, uh, ask it yourself. This is the first question. And shall I go on to the next one or do you want to? I think, I think, I think, I've, I think I've understood the question. So we, these experiments were done under particular conditions with light source coming from just one direction. So any changes in that we're talking about here are departures from optimal. Uh, so the optimal is uh, the animal in exactly the right location. Uh, so now we're, yeah, so here we're tilting it upwards through a number of degrees, here rolling it, and here moving it um, around, a, a rotating around a y-axis. Does, does that answer the question? Um, I, I'm not sure if Gal, if uh, this did not answer your question, then maybe you can uh, unmute yourself or ask later. Um, Actually, I didn't hear it because the net, net was down for a second. Oh. Can you please repeat it? Um, the, when we rendered the scenes, we rendered from one particular light source only, and uh, the animal was placed in the optimal position. Uh, and so these were departures from that optimality in using the three different degrees of freedom. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, but for each point, so it's just the location on each point on the animal or off the animal? Uh, no, this is a whole animal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, do you think the different phenotypes of um, um, CS 
might relate to the adaptation for different habitats. For example, a caterpillar in England would be a better hidden in a cloudy day than a caterpillar in sunny Israel. Yes. Uh, so, but let me let me come back to that when I've shown you the the wild bird experiments. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay. Okay. Shall I carry on? Yeah, sure. Uh, that that was all. Thanks, guys. Yes. So that. So uh, yeah, adapting to the conditions. This is a very interesting question, uh, one which we really wanted to address, but there's actually so little natural history done on these creatures that it's actually very hard to address. So we're not, despite the fact that there's a wild bird here with a real caterpillar in its mouth, we did this experiment uh, with uh, fake caterpillars that we rendered. So Experiments were done in a woodland that's used by Bristol University uh, for a lot of field work. So Simon Sangara was responsible for carrying out this experiment. We used cylinders uh, that were made from uh, paper uh, using a, a calibrated printer. So we roll them up and each one contains a, a mealworm bait, which a, a wild bird will take. We place them in a woodland uh, and then they're left there for a certain length of time, the experimenter comes back to, to find out whether they have been taken or not. So uh, we don't know what animal has predated them, we simply know whether they're still there, which we call alive, or uh, gone, which we, we call dead or predated. So these are a couple of photographs of uh, cylinders. This is a cylinder that is uh, rendered a uniform green, they're always placed on uh, bramble leaves, which is a, a, a bramble is a spiky plant with a black fruit uh, that's very common in an English woodland. And we have a range of different types of targets. So not countershaded, countershaded optimally for sunny weather, countershaded optimally for cloudy weather. Uh, and this is a, a countershading control. Similar experiments have been done with wild animals before, uh, but always using simple stimuli like this with a really hard gradient between a dark and a light. So these are the views in the photograph from the top and the views from the side. So what I'm going to plot for you in the results is the proportion that we've called alive uh, in light green, dead in red. Apologies for anyone who may be colorblind. This slide was prepared by a zoologist and uh, I was horrified when I saw that he used red and green. So we're going to look at the results for uh, cloudy day counter shading, a dark green uh, target, sunny, the two-tone and light green. And we're going to look at it in different weather. So the experimenter went out on a cloudy day, which in Bristol is, is very easy to achieve. Uh, and here are the results. So this is proportion. So 90% of the targets that were optimally rendered for cloudy day counter shading were still alive. In other words, they haven't been predated. It's very easy to measure if they're predated. Uh, essentially, the, the, little, the little cylinder has just gone. The animal pecks it, extracts the mealworm, and the whole thing flies off somewhere. And you can see that they were quite a few of the others were still alive, but uh, not as much. The crucial thing is the sunny day experiment. So he went out again on a sunny day. Um, and these were the results. Now, although quite a lot of the cloudy day counter shading targets were still alive, crucially, more of the sunny ones were. So the crucial results are to compare these two. Uh, so cloudy day, survives better uh, when it was in fact cloudy. Sunny day doesn't survive so well when it's cloudy, but survives better when it's sunny. So this isn't, yeah, this isn't quite the answer to the adaptation question that, that um, somebody just asked, uh, but it certainly shows that the birds are sensitive to the subtleties of this counter shading. So I wish I'd been able to go to Bristol to do this experiment, but sadly I wasn't able to. Now, interestingly, there's, there's four or five at least different species of bird in that, in that location that are common and that probably predate these animals. Because we weren't recording video at every site, we don't know which animals uh, were uh, doing the predating. 
But overall, for both the humans and the birds, we find for humans, there are subtle differences in the counter shaving pattern which have an impact on the search. Targets are easier to search for when the pattern departs from optimal for a given set of weather conditions or target orientation. In bird predators, these subtle differences do have an impact on predation. And these artificial caterpillars uh, were predated less when the counter shading is appropriate for the weather conditions. So that does lead back to the question somebody asked. So should a caterpillar be adapted to perhaps have a different shading gradient were it living in Scotland or in Israel? Um, the answer is quite probably. Uh, I'm going to show you some results of the sh what the shading patterns look like on real caterpillars in the, the next big bit of the talk. But the problem that we face is when we're breeding caterpillars in the lab, we collect them from, um, essentially you buy them from uh, caterpillar collector suppliers. Uh, these are animals that are bred in captivity for hobbyists. Uh, and so what we don't know is whether animals that were extracted from the wild in different locations, ideally of the same species, have different patterns of counter shading, but you'll but you'll see that we're not quite getting there, but we're trying. Um, just I have now managed to see the chat. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so, there are a few questions that I was thinking to let you continue in them. Oh yeah. So the next the next bit was okay. Well, what happens during the day? So yes, that was another thing that I asked. And uh, as a vision scientist, I thought, okay, the zoologist to be able to tell us, do these animals hang out? in the morning, at noon, in the evening. It's actually very hard to know uh, because A, if they're well camouflaged, they're hard for the naturalist to find them. Uh, and B, uh, it's also the case that if they're, if they're not adaptive for particular weather, you're gonna find them at the time of day when um, uh, they're least camouflaged and so you might think that there's more of them out at the time when there's actually less of them out so the natural history just hasn't been done uh, and so we weren't able to answer questions like this but I will show you what we were able to do so for the sort of final section of the talk we're looking at is real counter shading optimal to what extent are the real patterns appropriate for the shape and lifestyle of an animal we thought first about using museum specimens and we went to our local natural history museum which is about a two minute walk along the quad from where I am and uh, you can see by the look of these animals that we couldn't do this. Uh, the problem with museum animals is that they tend to be old, their, their pelt may have faded over time, it's really hard to, be, to, to know whether the patterning is anything like it was originally, but most importantly the shape of the animal when it's a museum specimen is specified by the taxidermist and we have no idea whether it, in life it had that shape at all. So we just threw away the idea of using museum specimens and instead, instead we went for caterpillars. So uh, this is a Tau emperor, also called Aglia Tau caterpillar, on a, on a, uh, a twig in, uh, in a, actually outside here in the quad. This is what happens when you turn the animal over. When you look at it here, you might think, well, of course it's not counter shaded, it looks uniform green. But when you turn it over, you see that it is because suddenly it now appears to be very light on one side and dark on the other. But we'll get to that when we measure it. So what extent are the real patterns appropriate for the real shape and lifestyle? We measured the 3D shape, obtained the reflectance and combined the two. So here is a lime hawk moth caterpillar uh, sitting in our experimental setup. Uh, we raised these animals in the lab and then we used a 3D scanner to measure their shape. So here's the 3D scanner. It has a, an illumination uh, lamp. It has a pair of stereo cameras which are going to extract the three dimensional shape we sit the thing on a table that can be rotated so we can slowly rotate the animal around to extract the shape from uh, different uh, viewing angles. It uses an optical method so it projects square waves of different frequencies and thankfully uses a, an onboard algorithm to calculate the shape. And it actually does this very nicely. So here's an example animal with its uh, rendered 3D shape shown on the screen alongside it. 
So here are some examples. This is the uh, rendered shape of a, an Adlia town. And this is a transect through uh, an Actius Luna. So we can, we can measure, actually we can measure the shape at any point on these animals, but we've done varying analyses uh, which are still ongoing to try and understand the interaction between the shape and the shading. Oops. So we want to obtain not only the shape of the animal, but also its reflectance. Uh, now the radiance is recovered using one of the scanning cameras. But of course, as I said before, the radiance depends on the object, but also on the light field according to this equation. So we want reflectance, but the camera delivers radiance. How do we get it? So we essentially, we use a, a gauge figure. We calculate the reflectance if we can also measure the irradiance. And we do that up to a constant factor by measuring the radiance of, of a Lambertian uniform reflectance sphere. And of course, the beautiful thing about a sphere is that it has a patch at every angle. So we, for any patch of any object, we can estimate what the irradiance is going to be. And that allows us to calculate uh, the reflectance. So when we've done that, uh, this is a normalized smooth reflectance pattern around a body transect. So here's the body transect and out from the center we have reflectance. So dark is in the middle, light is on the outside. And you can see that this animal uh, is dark here, dark on its belly, light on its back. Now that's the opposite way from what it should be, you may say, but actually it's not because these animals tend to lie. If this is a branch, they lie under the branch uh, and spend most of their lives feeding upside down. This is uh, the body geometry. Obviously what we want to do is compare these two. And uh, this is part of the project that, that we're still working on and we've done some analyses on so far. What I'm gonna show you is uh, the simplest one we have in uh, the interests of time. We take a point on the back and point on the belly. And we make the assumption that the outgoing radiance will be constant if the reflectance perfectly balances the irradiance, i.e. if um, uh, obliterative shading is occurring. Then we take a metric. We say that visibility is the absolute difference between the radiance of that point on the back minus the radiance of that point on the belly. Oops. And obviously there would be perfect camouflage if our visibility was zero according to this metric. So uh, because we don't know the perfect natural history conditions for any of these animals, we've actually modeled for a range of different latitudes, uh, uh, different skies, so different weathers, different times of day, different times of year, different orientations and so on. So what I'm going to show you in the next graph is a, a, an average over a number of those um, conditions uh, and with that use the model to estimate visibility. So uh, we're going to plot uh, the orientation of uh, the animal as a difference in pitch along the x-axis. I'm going to show you data for a uniform cylindrical gauge figure and uh, five different caterpillar species. So using our visibility metric as a function therefore of the body orientation. So the control species visibility looks like this. Why isn't this flat? This isn't flat of course because the this function depends on all of those different orientations that we use, different latitudes, different, uh, different weathers and so on. And so it comes out, the function comes out a little bit like this. So something that is not uh, countershaded at all should look like this. And our first caterpillar, the poplar hawk moth, uh, shows a very similar pattern to that. These four species, the lime, the luna, the aglia tau, and the eyed hawk moth are all thought to be countershaded and all lie, uh, typically lie on their backs hanging under branches. And when we look at visibility for those, we see that the visibility is best up here, not far from 90 degrees, and lowest, less visible down here at 270-ish. So if you ask the question, is there a 
body orientation that delivers minimal visibility? The answer is yes, and it's quite close to being this one. So what we've shown here is the first evidence that real animals, in particular the uh, hawk moth caterpillars, have counter shading that actually does reduce visibility. So to summarise that, we've compared the patterns of reflectance in the caterpillar shape, and the reflectance provides counter shading consistent with specific body orientation. And the caterpillar species have subtle counter shading that renders them less visible. So I'll quickly summarise the whole thing and then take questions. We developed our physical light model. We used it to predict optimal counter shading for um, uh, specific species. We've demonstrated that generalist predators, both human visual systems and wild birds, are sensitive to subtly different patterns of counter shading. And um, we are still working on it, but what I've showed you data there uh, for our real animals, we're showing that counter shading is appropriate for the shape uh, in several counter shading species. It certainly seems to make it less visible when it's, it's sitting at a, a particular uh, pitch. So I just want to thank you guys for listening. Thank my collaborators, an additional person, Philly Kamak, who helped with the caterpillar scanning, uh, and thanks to our funders and uh, our animals of uh, interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. It was a wonderful uh, and insightful talk. And I want to um, invite everybody to unmute yourself and to give a big um, applause to uh, Julie. Wonderful. Now, if you do see the chat, then you can, there are a few already. Yeah, a few I'm just going to chat. I also expand yeah. the chat. <laughs> How does a chameleon behave? Yeah, you know, and an octopus. Yeah, lots of in lots lots of interesting stuff. You know what? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what any of these animals do um, because hardly anybody has studied this at all. Um, there's there is a oh gosh, there is a paper from the one of the groups in Bristol uh, where they're trying to look at the natural history of. Um, I think deer-like animals, uh, ver uh, various ruminant animals that live in Africa, trying to look at their patterning uh, if they live in woodland or if they live in open savanna. Uh, and there are differences so that are consistent with the sort of stuff we've done here, but they didn't have a model of counter shading, so they weren't, weren't able to model it exactly. Um, yeah, animals that control their skin color somebody's asking about now that is really fascinating because one of, not only is it extraordinary that animals can control their skin color they must either be able to see or have some other organ that is potentially even on their skin uh, that can somehow see the pattern that they need to hide themselves against uh, so they require quite sophisticated sensory systems as well as the ability to rapidly change their pattern uh, again, very, very few studies have, have uh, worked on those. It would be lovely to work on those. I believe out here on the beach there are octopus, but actually we don't have any zoologists at St Andrews working on octopus. We have a lot of people here who work on seals and I, would, I wouldn't dare get near a seal to try and, try and measure its counter shading. Other questions? Oh, here's another one. Is there any evidence for animals using binocular rivalry for camouflage? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So I, I guess what you're saying here is that the predator would be fairly close to an animal and it might see one pattern in one eye and a different pattern in the other. Um, there isn't any evidence for that. What we've wondered but haven't successfully studied is whether there is any interaction also with, with stereopsis, because if you, if you have complex patterning on an animal, it can not only result in binocular rivalry, but there may be other uh, subtle effects of um, stereopsis. So imagine, I don't know if when you're viewing a, an auto stereogram, which some of you, you will have seen, you, you basically see a 
patch of noise on a page and as you move your eyes either in or out, the 3D stuff starts to emerge. But actually, if you, if you move them to, to uh, different vergence angles, you see different things. We have not been able to set up experiments to get that to work yet, but I, I would really like to. That, because then that ties into my binocular vision, uh, which is something I've always loved and always studied. Uh, Julia, I have a question. Okay. So you, you might have the perfect, first of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. And then my question is, you might have the best camouflage, but the predator is waiting until you slightly move and then the camouflage is gone away. And then this is actually the, if you look on the birds or something, waiting to see if, the, if it's camouflage or not, they're sitting like standing still until it's moving, then they go yeah. catch it. Yeah, I agree, you're quite right. Um, and we were beginning to think of some ideas for a grant on uh, motion and camouflage when the when the pandemic came along and I've been a bit a bit distracted with trying to do other things in the university but it's definitely the case that if you imagine yeah you're a bird in the woodland you're just waiting for the caterpillar or for something else to move and you're going to find it but actually those conditions might be quite rare uh, because quite often it's windy and so backgrounds and substrates that animals sit on may also be moving and there's been very little work on whether Julie, I um um looking in the chat again. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that was another, another. Strategy of the camouflage of the animal. I, so, so there is some really interesting, uh, again, if you look at the world, stick insects and leaf insects is something we've becoming interesting in because when they move, they make, they make very strange movements. Uh, it's not clear whether those movements might be purely biomechanical to do with the way in which their limbs are built and the way in which they have to move, or if those motions are providing some sort of camouflage. And in fact, sometimes it might even be the opposite of camouflage. Something we're now working on is, um, the opposite of camouflage is effectively the warning signal. So if you're, if, if you're back to the insect world, if you're a wasp, you have bright stripes. The idea there is that you're delivering a, a, memorable, a memorable pattern uh, that predators have learned uh, are consistent with something that tastes nasty. And so a warning signal draws the predator's attention, uh, but something about that signal means that they, they don't take the prey. It's possible that uh, animals, prey animals may move in a way that either camouflages them or that delivers some sort of creepy warning signal uh, and, and again, hasn't been studied. There's loads to do. So if anybody else wants to work on it, feel free. <laughs> I would also like to ask if you think that, um, I mean, you were talking about sunny environment and cloudy environment, and mm -hmm. uh, let's say an animal is not dynamically changing its um, skin color as some animals actually do. So do you think that, uh, would you hypothesize that the animal would um, suit uh, or adapt its um, coloring scheme to the most uh, frequent um, sh yeah, shading or, you know, uh, environment? Like in, that would yeah. answer the differences between Israel and the UK or even within the UK. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a prediction just just purely on, on predation grounds that animals that get predated are the ones that in any moment are easier to see than the background against which they sit. So if a caterpillar lives in Scotland, but it but it 
typically lives in the woodland rather than outside under under the under the sunshine uh, if it happens to stray out into that uh, non-wooded area it's more likely to get predated so they're more likely to be successful in the woods so so these these things form a circle so yes probably most frequent we naively when we took this project on we thought there would be lots of natural history research that told us where the animals were more likely to live at what latitudes and we had even hoped that we might find the same species but with different patterning depending on environment or or latitude but it's it's turned out that we have not been able to test those hypotheses yet. Okay. Um, uh, oh, I can't hear you. It's gone. It's gone mute for some reason. Okay, Sorry. that's better. So, <laughs> so do you think um, um, camouflaging is um, uh, or animals? Uh, I mean, if we think of um, um, Darwinian uh, concepts maybe they tend to be more camouflaged in areas where they have um, more dangers surrounding them. Because if you have an environment that there's no danger for you of being um, uh, predated, then it's not an issue for you to invest in that and then you can survive. I I'm just thinking that that also might. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't know as much about evolutionary biology as the zoologists do. Mm. Although almost everything gets predated. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're no, we're, I mean, uh, hu humans are not particularly uh, camouflaged, but uh, that's because we have brains that allow us to do other things to stop us being predated, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um. There's another um, question in the chat, but about mates, is there a side effect uh, of uh, camouflaging or counter? Um... Counter shading for finding mates. So yeah, another very interesting question to which I don't have an answer. So of course, um, the coloration on an animal, it can be about, uh, it could be a warning signal, as I've just talked about. It could be camouflage that's trying to hide. But as this, this person has also pointed out, um, many animals are, are very brightly patterned for mate choice purposes. Uh, I have not seen anybody suggest that counter shading might be a sexual signal. Um, but of course it, it might. Uh, it, I haven't seen any research on that. Um, if you're thinking about sort of uh, mammals like deer, their patterning is very dramatic. It could be, um, but I, I don't know of any examples. Um. Okay, the <laughs> Somebody's asked the zebra question in the chat. Is it true that the light and dark strikes of a zebra's coat reflect different polarizations in a way that upsets the attractiveness of uh, tabernids, which are horse flies? Um, I don't know whether it's true or not, but there is there is some published data that supports that. Uh, there is data suggesting that flies don't land on zebra stripes. Uh, and the suggestion has been made is, is, is that the, it, it's the, the polarization is causing some sort of effect that puts them off. Um, there are also theories about zebra, zebra stripes providing camouflage when the animals are herding together. Uh, and the, and that, that's a sort of motion breaking camouflage because it's very hard to distinguish between one animal and another. Of course, it's easy to set those up as competing theories, but it's quite possible that they're, that they're both correct. So yeah, there's definitely some research that supports that idea. Lovely, Julie. So um, again, um, if there are any more questions, then uh, you're welcome to ask. But um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for uh, um, presenting your really interesting research in our seminar. It was a great talk. and. Um, Again, thank you for um, joining us. And I hope you'll also join us uh, in our next uh, talks in the series uh, this year.
Um, next week we have um, Shlomit uh, Green, Yuval Greenberg, uh, who will speak. Well, I haven't uh, received the title yet, but I'm sure it's also going to be a very interesting talk. So thanks so much, uh, Julie. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to say thanks very much for inviting me and, and I'll maybe one day out and come visit for real. That would be oh, really lovely. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. We'll, uh, okay. we'll be glad, very glad to have you physically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be nice. Yes. <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.